Hello, my name is Bill Daniels, and I'm the project leader for Native Seed Communities, which is a project of the Indiana Native Plant Society. We're very glad that you've joined us tonight for Eileen Davis's presentation on starting native plants from seed. Uh, before I introduce Eileen, I'd like to share with you some information about Native Seed Communities. We promote networks of native plant enthusiasts working together to procure, to process, and to propagate native plant seeds to increase the presence of these beautiful and ecologically appropriate native plants in all of our landscapes. Our presentations such as tonight are devoted to discussing the propagation of native plants from seeds and the spotlighting, uh, spotlighting of organizations and individuals that mobilize native plant enthusiasts to use these seed grown plants in their local landscapes. We have a lot of resources on the web and through social media that we'll share links to in the chat. One final note uh, for the best experience for everyone, please keep yourself muted unless of course you are invited to unmute. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Let me introduce our speaker. Eileen Davis is an environmental educator for Lake County Forest Preserves and has variously served the Lake County Forest Preserves as an intern, volunteer and staff member since 1997. She earned her BS in zoology and environmental biology from Eastern Illinois University and an MS in environmental education and interpretation from University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. Eileen teaches people of all ages about Lake County's diverse ecosystems and the plants and animals that call them home. In her free time, she enjoys tending her home garden and traveling in search of new nature adventures. So I now present to you, Eileen Davis. Well, thank you so much for having me tonight. And it's been exciting. I've been reading through the, the chat as folks have been coming in and seeing so many people from so many different places. Um, for those of you in Indiana, the Lake County that I am from is, is across the lake. I'm over in Northeastern Illinois and an educator with the Lake County Forest Preserves. Um, and as uh, you mentioned during the intro, I've been there a really long time. <laughs> they couldn't quite get rid of me once they hired me as an intern way back in 1997. Um, the Lake County Forest Preserves is one of um, several forest preserves in Illinois. Uh, we have a lot of them around the Chicago region, if you're not familiar with it. And our mission at the Lake County Forest Preserves, I like to think of it as four pillars to our mission. Um, two very important pillars are the preservation and restoration of our uh, open space and, and natural areas in Lake County. And we are the current stewards of over 30,000 acres of land in Lake County, which is really impressive. We're, a, we're the second largest forest preserve system in Illinois. We are um, lagging a little bit behind Cook County, which is the county that Chicago is located in. They have, I think, 80,000 acres. So um, they've got a lot of land there to, to steward as well. The other two pillars of our mission are education and recreation. And I'm in the education department along with several other environmental educators. And that also includes our history education out of our Best Power Dunn Museum in Libertyville. Um, as the stewards of that 30,000 acres of land in Lake County, um, we are always very aware of the fact that that 30,000 acres represents just 10% of the land in Lake County. The other 90% is privately held by homeowners, businesses, municipalities, school districts. So the work that we do on our land to, um, to restore and to um, protect it does a lot of work, it does a lot of good, but unfortunately um, we really want to reach out um, because we have so much more land in the county that, that we are not able to have an influence over. So over the last several years, we've been really um, reaching out to all kinds of organizations in, in Lake County to really encourage folks to bring more natives into their landscape, whether you're a business owner or a school district or a private landowner. And we have a really robust education program to support those initiatives. And I'm here tonight to share with you one of those programs. And one of the programs that we've developed over the last few years is um, uh, the starting native plants from seed to give folks some guidance on how to get these going from seed, because as you may all know, as native gardeners, 
um, buying those plugs can be a little pricey. So if you can get uh, get some seeds and be able to learn the tricks to germination, you can add more of these plants to your home landscape in a much more economical way. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna get going here um, by sharing my screen. And as I do that, I am gonna turn my camera off just because it allows me to see the whole screen a little bit better. Um, I think as we go along tonight, what we're gonna encourage is if you have questions as we're going along, please feel free to type them in the chat. And uh, Deb is gonna help me out if she feels that uh, it's really pertinent to what we're talking about right at that moment, she'll, you know, she'll stop me and we can answer the question while we're on that slide. Uh, but we also may, uh, we'll definitely have some time at the end for questions. So I'm still here and just turn it off my video. There we go. And allowing myself to see the screen a little bit here. All right. So tonight's program, um, as we go along, I just want to preface by saying um, this is sort of the beginner's guide to um, some of the tips and tricks to sparking germination of these native seeds. And we'll talk a little bit about why they can be a little bit tricky to get going. Um, I've um, shared a lot of resources that I have found helpful. Um, and those will all get put in the chat as we go along. And I'll, I'll pop a few of them up on the on the screen tonight as we're going along as well. There is a lot to learn about this. I'm continually learning myself. I'm a bit of uh, obsessed with native plant gardening, and I definitely have gotten really, really uh, interested in trying to to grow these from these plants from seed um, for not only my own yard, but I. I like to share. I sometimes put a table at the end of my driveway when I have extra seedlings and trying to, to move these plants around my neighborhood. So um, we're going to do a pretty high level look at some of the different strategies. And I'll give you a lot of resources that will allow you to, um, no pun intended, well, okay, pun intended, to dig a little deeper into the topic. Because if you're like me, um, you'll get hooked. So I, I won't spend too much time on this because I think you folks are, are pretty familiar with what is a native plant. Uh, we, we define that usually as a plant that grows in a specific geographic location prior to Euro-American settlement. So where I'm at in Lake County, Illinois, we're looking at, um, you know, before the early 1800s. These plants are adapted to our local climate conditions, and of course, they're utilized by uh, native wildlife, and I could probably spend the next hour extolling the virtues of native plants in the home landscape, but like I said, I think um, you guys are already on board with that. So I want to just start by um, talking a little bit about what are some of the pros and cons from starting or to starting plants from seed. Uh, definitely one of the big pros is it's less expensive. You can, um, you know, get free seeds at seed swaps or from a fellow native gardener, or you could buy a, a packet of seeds pretty relatively inexpensively from some um, uh, uh, resources that we've shared in the chat that you're probably already familiar with, um, like Prairie Moon Nursery or Prairie Nursery. Uh, both are great resources for, for native seed. Um, another really big pro is that you can uh, have access to quite a variety of different plants when you're doing it from seed. Oh, uh, up in our area of Lake County, I'm sure it's the same where you are, we have a lot of native plant sales in the spring. And once that's kind of done, um, it, as things wind down, it can be tricky to find some native plants that are actual plants um, through the rest of the growing season. It's about a once a year shot, unless you're ordering them online and having them delivered to your house. So doing it from, from seed, you can really pick and choose the plants that you want to grow and, and have um, quite a bit of variety. And of course, there's where there's a pro, there's always a con. <laughs> Um, it can be a little bit more time consuming than just going to a native plant sale and picking out the plants that you want. And some species, some native species can be difficult to grow. And so I've put examples of uh, one species that's super easy to grow on the screen here and one species that is really pretty tricky to grow. So the bee balm, the monarda up there on the top right, um, this is one of the species that we'll talk about a little bit later, but it's it's fairly easy to grow. You can grow it just like you're used to growing, um, you know, other annuals and things like that. Um, the jack in the pulpit, however, is a bit trickier and has quite a few different uh, steps 
to try and get the seeds to, to germinate there. When sourcing your seeds, a couple of things uh, that I wanna just mention out front here is uh, definitely you can collect seed from existing plants. I have my little uh, asterisk there that um, where I'm at in, in Illinois, collecting of any kind is not allowed in our forest preserves. I do this program a lot for Lake County groups, so I have to mention that. Um, and I'm sure it's it's similar where you guys are living. So you always want to get permission from a landowner and some places you might not be able to collect. But if you have a network of fellow native gardeners, um, you may be able to um, swap seeds or go into their yard and collect some seeds. Um, so that's always uh, uh, a, a good resource. And then, of course, purchasing seeds. When I do purchase seeds, I use Prairie Moon Nursery. Prairie Nursery also um, sells seeds. I've just kind of always started with Prairie Moon, um, but I've got a, enough of a variety in my yard now that I'm, I'm really getting into collecting from my own yard and, and processing those seeds or not processing the seeds and just planting them and have had pretty good success. Um, so as you're gonna, if you are gonna harvest your own seeds, there's just a few things to keep in mind. And we'll we'll go through these um, at the beginning. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this because one of the resources I gave you was a, a seed guide that a restoration ecologist at the Lake County Forest Preserves put together with one of our volunteers. It's a really great resource. And I'll, I'll, I'll show that to you guys um, a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, but it's important to know um, when to collect, how to collect, how you're gonna store, if you are gonna process the seeds in any way, and then of course, when to sow the seeds. And um, so I just wanna talk real quickly um, uh, and touch on those points a little bit. So uh, when do you collect seeds? And a little tongue in cheek, well, of course you um, collect the seeds when they're ripe, but every plant is gonna have a different uh, time on, timing on that. So for example, the picture up on the top there is of a common milkweed pod. It's all green and um, the pot is intact. It hasn't split at all. So that is not a time to collect milkweed seeds. The seeds are not ready yet. Now, if that pod were green, but it, it had split and you could see the seeds peeking through, but it hadn't gotten all fluffy yet, that's okay to collect then. The seeds are ready. Um, so you don't necessarily have to go just by color on the milkweeds. Uh, it's when the pod is... Um, is split, or of course, if it doesn't split before it turns kind of that gray brown, then you know it's it's ready to go as well when it turns nice and dry. Uh, you can if the seeds are falling easily from the plant, that's a good time to collect. Um, if you've got seed capsules that are bursting, that's a good indication that the seeds are ready to go. And usually, ripe seeds are going to be plump and dark and a little bit harder. Um, uh, for things other than, than the berries. Of course, berries are gonna have a fruit around them. And if you can, try to collect on a dry day. Um, the other two pictures there, uh, one, it looks like it's some type of aster, possibly it's all fluffy, like our dandelions in our yard, that's a good time to collect. And then those are some maple seeds down there and they're all dried up and brown. And usually they'll be falling from a tree and twirling around your yard. So you'll know those are ready to go at that point. I'll touch a little bit on some of the main categories that um, the seed guide that I, I shared, um, Kelly and Dale put together and they have um, little, or they have categories that they kind of split the um, seed different species into that gives you an under, a better understanding of when to collect and how to collect. And we'll start with that first one up there. Uh, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but I call them eliosomes. Um, Kelly, uh, it, the, Kelly Schultz is our restoration ecologist. She used to run our seed nursery and she put together this seed guide. She calls them ant candy. And that's a picture of bloodroot, a bloodroot seed pod there. And you can see the dark brown seeds. And then you see that kind of little fleshy white part. That's the eliosome. And that is a food, a type of food that ants absolutely love. So they will run around collecting these seeds take them back to their um, to their their nests and they they eat that eliosome and then they discard the seeds. So they are are really key in dispersing these types of seeds. So if you're going to collect them, you want to collect it. Um, you got to be really on top of, of these types of plants and, and you want to get them before the ants get them. 
Another category, uh, the picture there is showing wild geranium. It's called the ballistic. And these types of plants just, um, they wanna get their seeds far away from them, right? They don't want their babies growing right down near their roots, competing for resources with the parent plant. So if you look in this series of photos here, um, the, Kelly calls this sequence, the ready, the aim and the fire. <laughs> and what you wanna do is um, look at the picture on the far left here. And wild geranium is sometimes referred to as wild crane's bill. And that's because this, this spike here looks kind of like a, a bird beak. But in the ready stage, you can see these little knobs down at the base, and then there's a green spike coming up. And those little balls down there, I think there's about five of them, those are the seeds. And what eventually happens is this green part of the pod dries out. So here's your aim sequence, the second picture. This is when you collect them. You want to get them before that little um, pod dries out and splits. And then it's almost like a little ladle on the bottom and it catapults the seeds away from the parent plant. And so if you collect the seed heads and cut them off when they're in this stage and put them in a paper bag and just leave them somewhere cool and dry, what you'll start to hear is it sounds like microwave popcorn exploding <laughs> in the paper bag and these um, pods are drying out and they are um, you know, shooting the seeds, but you're containing them in the bag. If your plant already has this beautiful little candelabra kind of look to it, the seeds are already gone. So it's you're a little too late there. So try and get them in, this is the fire stage. So ready, aim, fire. There's a whole group of plants out there that have um, these fluffy seed heads. And those little fluffs are like parachutes or feathers, you can think of them that way, that are going to help blow the seeds away from the parent plant. And so you can collect them when they're in this stage right here. Uh, but if you think about uh, like a dandelion and the life cycle it goes through in your yard, you start with that pretty yellow flower. After the insects have pollinated it, um, the flower will, itself will close up and you see the beginnings of little white fluffs at the top there and then it'll open up into that white fluffy ball that we are all familiar with. You can even collect these seeds, these fluffy ones, before they open. If you just see those little white puffs starting at the top, again, cut off the seed heads, pop them in a brown paper bag and just set them somewhere, they'll finish drying out and you'll be able to contain the seeds a little bit more. Um, the next category on this page here is, um, there's a variety of plants that will kind of encase their seeds in a berry. And uh, very often those berries turn bright red or blue or purple, and that's to attract birds and other animals to eat them and carry the seeds away and deposit them a little farther away with a nice little fertilizer packet. Um, and so they're, these guys though, you, you definitely, um, they're not meant for long-term storage. They're not, it's not good if they dry out. So the, in the picture here, it looks like it's probably false Solomon seal. If you collect those berries um, and kind of, I, some people have um, uh, the, the juices and things on these plants can cause skin irritation. So wear, you know, wear a pair of vinyl gloves or, or something like that. And um, uh, just kind of rub the seeds out of the berries, give them a little bit of a rinse, and then you can sow them immediately or keep them in a, in a plastic bag with, um, uh, with some moist paper towel so that it stays nice and moist in there until you're ready to plant them. Um, before I go too much further, I forgot to talk, um, which is really important, and that's about collecting seeds and how much to collect. So if you've gotten permission from a landowner or you're collecting from your own, um, your own population, you generally wanna leave about 50% of the seeds where they are on the plant and, and don't collect any more than 50%. Um, and with some more rare species, you probably wanna collect even fewer um, and, and just make sure there's a, a population of seeds that are gonna be there to help the plant self seed and continue to, to grow in that area. But also you wanna leave some food for the birds and the other critters that are out there. So that's a guideline that we, we typically follow at the forest preserves and how you figure out that 50%, whether you look at, you know, one plant and you only take 50% of the, the seeds that are on that plant, or um, if you've got 10 plants, you take the seeds from five plants, 
just as a general rule, try to leave about half of them in place. Another big category are, are the shakers. And I believe that's a picture of uh, bergamot, the bee balm there. And it's actually, you know, all those individual little tubes are gonna hold a seed. And um, it's almost like a salt shaker head. And you'll know those are ready. The seed head kind of turns a darker brown. And if you kind of tip one out in your hand and shake it a little bit, if seeds start to come out, then you know it's ready. If no seeds come out, then give it a few more days to dry out and just keep checking back. And um, and then again, you can go in and collect once, once you start to get seeds shaking out of those seed heads. Uh, several different species are in the category that we call beaks. And uh, right there is wild columbine. And after the columbine blooms and has been pollinated, you get sort of this, this um, green cup structure. And as that dries out, it's going to open up. And I pulled this out of our native garden at, um, at my office at the Ryerson Woods Conservation Area yesterday. And this is a wild columbine beak and I tipped it out and all those, it's really quite easy. It, it, it opens up, it's like a little cup. You just tip the seeds out. In my own yard, I usually go around with a little jar and tip the seeds out into the jar. Um, now, Bucky, that's, uh, another, away. another category are cone heads. Um, we've got a uh, purple cone. You want to work on your work? <laughs> we've got a purple cone head, a purple cone flower seed head in this picture. Um, and they are ready when the, the seed head is completely dried out. These guys can be spiky. So when you're harvesting them, I like to use garden gloves, but really if it, it takes a little bit of pressure, but if they're ready to go, you can quite easily kind of rub the seeds off um, into a bag or some other kind of bucket or container. Um, the one below there, the crumbly cone head, which are things like yellow cone flower, those are super easy. I don't even use gloves with these guys. When they're ready to go, the seed head is quite dark um, and very easily, if you just um, pinch the seed head between your fingers, it, it the seeds just all crumble off of there. Hence the name crumbly cone heads. Last two that I wanted to just introduce you to, one is called shattering. Um, it's a, a little, of, it's a little, I don't know if I, the shattering thing gets me a little confused, but the general idea is that these seeds are not necessarily held in some kind of capsule. And with very little effort, you can just strip them right off of the plant. So this is bottle brush grass in the picture. A lot of our native grasses and some other different species of, of wildflowers are in this shattering category. And um, for example, for the bottle brush grass that we see in, this, in the picture there, when those are, um, are all dried out and if you ran your hand up the stem, they would come off very easily um, and you would know that they're ready to collect. Last one are our friends, the hitchhikers. And these different seeds um, have little spikes or burrs or hairs on them that, um, that get stuck uh, optimally in an animal's fur, or maybe sometimes on my shoelaces or uh, the sleeve of a, a fleece jacket. And then I'm wandering around or, you know, a fox is moving around and then they scratch the seed off much farther away from, from the parent plant. So just some different categories that helps you to know. Um, and they're, they're uh, explained in a little bit more detail in our seed guide. And it does give you a little bit more of an understanding of when the seeds are going to be ready to be harvested if, if you're trying to harvest on your own. So before I jump too much into the, the germination um, part of things, do we have any questions that should be answered right now? Eileen, I have not seen any. Great. Uh, but I actually have one of my own. Um, okay. If you find that you have collected um, a seed or a seed pod maybe too early. Will mm -hmm. it continue developing and mature for uh, the seeds to be used? Or is it you you screwed up and you collect them too early and they will not germinate? I think it depends a little bit on the species. Um, you know, of course, some of the more nasty plants like garlic mustard, those will continue to um, to mature. Um, but for the natives, things like the asters, if the flower has been pollinated and it's closed up, but it's not quite ready, 
Um, I, I think it's worth a try to put those things in a, in a paper bag and just put them somewhere um, cool and dry and let them continue to dry out and just give it a try. Um, but I think it, it varies a bit. It kind of depends on how far along it is, even if it's not quite ready, if it's close, um, it, it might vary between species. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. So this um, next section is all about the secrets to germination. And um, our native plants all have some really cool adaptations to ensure the greatest um, percentage of germination in their seeds. So if you think about our, our typical fall weather, so we could get kind of cold and rainy in September and then have a gorgeous, really warm, dry fall. And if our plants are like, whoo hoo, 75 degrees and I'm gonna go ahead and germinate, well, we know December, January, February, and March are following close on the heels of that warm, warm fall. And those plants wouldn't survive that. Those tender little seedlings wouldn't survive it. So a lot of our plants have built in mechanisms that um, they need to experience a really, you know, cold, wet conditions for prolonged periods of time. And then when the soil starts to warm up and the, the you know, the area starts to warm up, that's when that's going to spark the germination. And that can be really frustrating for, for gardeners that are just getting started in trying to grow native plants. Because a, uh, a lot of people might be used to go into your local garden center and, you know, you get a package of marigold seeds or you get a package of bean seeds or tomato seeds and I can just pop those in the soil and they'll grow for me. Why won't these native plants? So um, there are some different tricks depending on the species and we're gonna cover um, some of these tricks. And basically what we're trying to do is just recreate the natural conditions that the seeds would go, go through if they were to just drop from the parent plant and grow on their own out in the wild. And the different methods that I'm going to cover tonight are just what we call direct sowing. We're gonna talk about stratification scarification, and then I have an other category. <laughs> and I do wanna um, make sure to let you know that when you are purchasing seeds from uh, different providers like Prairie Moon Nursery or Prairie Nursery, they provide a lot of uh, really great information and they, they will provide what are called germination codes. Prairie Moon Nursery in particular, you can just go on their website. You don't even have to buy seeds from them. Um, but I will say they're, they're really good seeds and they're ethically, um, they're ethically uh, collected. Um, you can go on their website and they've got a ton of resources on their species by species. You can say the blue flag iris that is in the picture here. You can go on their website, put in the search bar, blue flag iris, a whole page about that plant will come up, tell you everything you ever wanted to know about it. It gives you the germination code and the instructions on if you were going to be trying to grow it from seed. And a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you tonight, I give credit to them, but I do pull a lot of information from their website. And that's where I go when I'm when I'm trying to figure out how to do these things. Um, so there's a lot of really great support and resources out there. So the direct sow method. This is the easiest one. Yay! No pretreatment is needed. These species can just be grown like any other seeds you would grow on the soil surface in your garden, or you can even grow them under grow lights indoors. Um, the timing of when to start doing that can be a little bit different depending on the species. And again, all that information is provided for you when you purchase these seeds from, from suppliers. Some species may germinate best um, when sown in warm soil. So then you're gonna be sowing those in late spring, early summer. Some will germinate best if you put them first in cool soil. So um, throwing them out in late fall for them to sit out over the winter or, or very early in the spring. And um, some species can be spread directly on the soil surface while others might need a light dusting of soil. Um, in general, most of our native plants don't, you don't need to really put them very deep in the soil at all, the seeds. And if you think about how they, they spread their seeds on the, in the as I, I'm doing air quotes here, in the wild, <laughs> um, the seeds fall from the plant or they blow and they land on, as long as that seed is in contact with the soil, um, you're gonna have a pretty good chance of germination. Some of them 
if you are going to put them under the soil, you don't really want to put them any deeper than the seed itself is wide. And as you start playing with native seeds, you'll know you'll notice that they're very, very tiny. So a sowing them on the surface with a light, even a light dusting of soil is is fine. Um, and I'm going to go into more about winter sowing um, in, a little bit more in the presentation, but I want to say this often <laughs> because this is really an easy way to do it. If you have an area in your garden and you want to use seeds, for the most part, you can, you know, prepare the area where you want to put the seeds, make sure that the seeds can get good seed to soil contact. And generally speaking, between Thanksgiving and January 1st, if you put those in our area, in my area up here in Northern Illinois, um, you put those seeds down in the garden. And it's especially great if there's a snow that's coming and the snow is going to blanket it. And they, they get to spend, um, you know, at least a good 90 days in cold, damp conditions. They'll, they'll sprout for you pretty easily. And um, that's both these direct sowing ones and the other more complicated ones as well. Some examples of species that work well uh, under the direct sow are the purple cone flower, um, the sneezeweed, which is blooming right now in my yard. And I absolutely love it. And the bumblebees are going crazy for it. A lot of our native grasses like prairie drop seed can be direct sown. Um, Culver's root is one that doesn't need any pretreatment and then bee balm or Minarda. Um, when, when I do programs about native plants and adding them to your home landscape, I always uh, get questions from folks that are just getting started and, and if what would you recommend I start with? And I always recommend bee balm and like three plants. If you can put three plants in your home garden, put in bee balm. It's super easy to get going. You'll feel really successful and you won't get frustrated and you'll keep going. It's a fantastic pollinator plant as um, uh, one of our, our rare pollinators, the rusty patch bumblebee often will feed on this one. Um, and uh, the other species are throw in one species of milkweed, whichever milkweed works in your yard. And then if you have space for an oak tree, those three species, if you can just start with those, you're gonna be doing a lot of good in your yard. Um, also on the Prairie Moon website, when you are looking at the resources, they have they will link you to every species that they sell that you can um, grow with the direct sow method. So again, really great support and resources. All right. Um, before I jump into stratification, any questions about direct sowing? Uh, yes, there was one. Let me pull okay. it back up. Uh, so um, Sarah wanted to know if they can plant seeds in small individual trays and go ahead and leave them outside uh, over winter. Um, and that way they're creating their own small plugs. Yes, it, you can. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail when we get to the section on winter sowing. So that's coming up pretty quick, but that's a really great way to, to start growing your seeds. Um, in uh, in a way that then you know you know I put those seeds in that pot and I labeled it so I know what the plant is that's coming up. Sometimes when you sprinkle them in your garden, it can be a little bit tricky to know which is a weed and which is your native plant until you get a little bit more experience. So we'll go into that in a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides. Perfect, thank you. Um, yeah, stratification is the next method that I wanted to talk about, and that's where we're kind of simulating those natural weather cycles that the seed would go to or go through if it were to grow on its own in the, again, air quotes, in the wild. Um, and there's three uh, main categories of, of stratification that we're going to talk about today. One is cold, moist, uh, warm, moist. Uh, another one is warm, uh, moist, followed by cold, moist. And then the third is cold, moist, followed by warm, moist followed by a second cold moist. <laughs> so it can get a, a bit more complicated. So es essentially what we're doing in cold moist stratification um, is we're, we're mixing our seeds with some kind of medium. So we can put it in moist sand. And um, this is good if you're gonna be, um, I like using this method in the sand with um, um, really small seeds that, um, I'm either gonna be planting in big trays and rows or just I, I'll mix almost equal parts sand with the seed so that when I sprinkle it on my, my trays, I, I make sure I'm getting some seed in there. 
Um, and basically, as the pictures show, you're um, kind of moistening some sand and you can buy the sand from Prairie Moon or as long as it's a fine um, sand, um, nothing really coarse and chunky, it'll work. And you just want to barely moisten it so that as you see in that third picture, you can hold it together in a clump. You don't want it dripping. You don't want it really any kind of standing water in there. You mix your seeds with that and then you put them in a little plastic bag and label the bag with the um, uh, the date that you're putting them in. And then each um, native plant species has an optimal number of days to spend in your refrigerator in that bag that, that will give you the greatest um, possibility of good germination. And again, that's all included when you buy these seeds or you can look it up on the Prairie Moon website. And so, um, and you just got to check it periodically to make sure there's no mold growing in there, that the sand hasn't dried out, or that you don't have any seeds sprouting. If you have a few seeds um, sprouting, um, you know, that's you can pick those out. But if a lot of your seeds start sprouting, you're going to want to get them planted immediately because that means your seed is ready to go. Um, another method that you can use if, if you have, I like using this um, I, I played around with this coffee filter method last winter, and I learned a few valuable lessons. Uh, this is a great way to do it if um, I liked it for larger seeds, my really fine, tiny seeds. I found it really difficult when I was taking them out of their stratification to pick the seeds off and get them off my fingers and into the soil. So I would use the sand method with those small, tiny ones. Um, but this is good if you're planting in individual pots because you'll be able to pick the seeds off a little bit easier and, and you know, just get two or three seeds per little pot. But basically the idea is um, you um, put your coffee filter in some kind of colander, you put your seeds in there, pour some water over it, let the water drain out, put a second dry coffee filter on top, fold it all up, and again, put it in a, a really well-labeled plastic bag with the date you put it in and your target date for taking it out. Again, periodically check them. Some of these species need 90 days in the refrigerator. And if you're seeing sprouting or mold, you wanna, um, or your coffee filter's drying out, you wanna just make sure that it's staying pretty evenly moist. And again, you don't want water dripping off the coffee filter. So let it kind of dry in that colander for a little bit so you don't have really um, standing water in your plastic bag. Some examples of species that need cold, moist stratification. Um, New England aster does best if they get at least 60 days. Um, common milkweed is 30 days and wild columbine is 60 days. And again, what we're doing is just simulating what it would be like for the seed to drop from the parent plant and spend the winter out in um, you know, a cold, moist environment. And what you're going to want to do then as you're planning for your seed starting, um, if you want to start your seeds on March 1st under grow lights, then you got to back it up 60 days and that's when you put those seeds or 30 days or 90 days. That's when you put those seeds in the refrigerator so that on March 1st, they've already spent their time in your refrigerator and um, you know, up in March, early March is usually my target for starting seeds because typically I can get things out in the garden um, by mid the second or third week in May and feel pretty safe about it. And everybody's gonna be happy. And, and for the most part where I'm at, I think I'm in 5B, I think it's 5B, um, uh, growing his own 5B. By Mother's Day or the week after, we're not getting too many frosts after, after that or at all. So this is simulating if that New England aster dropped its seeds in October or November, and that plant spent one winter, and then it's going to germinate the next spring. Some species are going, their seed is going to ripen um, either earlier in the season, like the spring beauty um, or uh, the wild ginger, but some of them just require warm moist followed by cold moist. So basically we're simulating the seeds ripening and dropping to the ground. At some point in the summer, they get a good dose of warm, moist weather, followed by a winter, and then they'll, they'll, um, they'll germinate after that. So when you're using that method, you do exactly what we just demonstrate or showed you. 
But instead of putting everything in the refrigerator first, they sit for 60 to 90 days, again, depending on the species, at about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and then 60 to 90 days in the refrigerator. So again, if March 1st is your target um, planting day, you got to back it up almost 180 days, depending on your species. So you can, you're seeing this process is, is getting a little bit more involved. <laughs> and these are some examples of species that do need that warm, moist, moist, followed by a cold moist. So again, summer, fall, winter, and then they'll germinate the next time it gets warm enough. The last one is why I buy all these seeds from, from a plant sale. <laughs> or these plants, I don't try and grow them. So basically they need cold moist, followed by a warm moist, followed by a second cold moist, and then they'll germinate. So in the case of Jack in the Pulpit, I think I saw in the chat earlier tonight, somebody was having struggles growing Jack in the Pulpit. Um, when those flowers get uh, pollinated, they make these clusters of, and of berries. Those berries turn from green to a bright red. Various critters I know in my yard move these berries around because I get Jack in the pulpit popping up in all kinds of crazy places that I didn't originally plant it. And I'm just happy to let Mother Nature move the Jack and pulpit around my yard because they're, they're, so those seeds are getting ripe now. So essentially what's happening for Jack in the pulpit is they need to spend the winter, the whole next spring, summer and fall, followed by a second winter. And then the next spring after that is when they'll germinate. Jewelweed is similar, and so is Solomon seal. All three of these plants, their seeds are ready at, at, at this time of year. Um, and so they're going to be moving from the plant or dropping to the ground or whatever at this time of year. So um, it requires a lot of patience to grow these seeds. and um, But it's a really great insurance policy for the plant. Imagine if... Um, you know, we had a really crazy spring and summer drought. Then, um, you know, if if I had all my seeds germinate and the babies would die off, then there's nothing kind of there around to, to kind of keep my species going. But in the case of Jack in the Pulpit, it's going to go through a couple of seasons and, and, and then have a, you know, better chance when the, when the conditions are a little bit more optimal. So um, at this point, I usually start talking about like your local native plant sales, <laughs> because for some species, at least kind of the approach I've been taking, I may um, get adventurous and, and try to grow these species here on the page from seed myself at some point in the future. But uh, right now, I, I consider myself at the beginning stages of seed propagation, and I don't feel quite confident enough to tackle these yet. So there are some species I do order um, as plugs or plants or get them at native plant sales just um, because it can be a little involved. So, so the next, um, excuse me, big category is called scarification. And sometimes we can get confused between the stratification and scarification. And I always remember that scarification is like scratching. So that SC, the beginning. Uh, but the idea here is that these are seeds that have really thick um, um, seed coats or, or coverings. And in order for us to kind of get that process going, we need um, to rough up the seed coat a little bit and that allows moisture in and that allows the seed to kind of swell and, and, and to start to germinate. So the process, um, you can use a file, but medium grit uh, sandpaper is going to work just fine for um, a lot of these native seeds that require this. Um, and it's just a gentle rubbing. You're just roughing up the, the seed coat a little bit. If you're crushing the seeds, it's you're going too hard and, and, and you're going to get a little bit more gentle there. If it's a species that requires both scarification and stratification, you want to scarify or scratch it before you stratify it in your refrigerator or whatever method you need to use. If it's a species that requires scarification, but you're just going to put the seeds outside in the late fall and let them sit out there all winter, you don't need to do any scratching at all because it's the natural freeze and thaw cycles and the, the grit and other things in the soil are going to do that for you. Um, so 
another um, a little check in the positive column for, for sowing your seeds out, outside directly in the fall or doing winter sowing because you don't have to, to mess with this process too much. And two of the, the species in our area that require this are um, the wild blue indigo or the baptisia and wild lupin. They're in that legume family. They've got fairly good sized seeds um, and they do need th to have those uh, their seed coats scratched up a little bit. I believe that Prairie Moon Nursery does that for you if you order the seeds from them. Um, but if you're collecting them from a neighbor or, or your own yard, um, you would have to do that scarification uh, on your own. All right, before I jump to the, the other page, I see lots of little, lots of comments in the chat. So I just wanna check in and see if I should be answering any questions before we go any farther. Sure, Eileen. Um, so back when you were talking about um, the uh, seeds in the refrigerator. Yes. Uh, there is a question uh, related to that. Okay. If they are not sprouting, is it okay to leave the seeds in the refrigerator longer than the normal 30, 60, 90, 120 day? I would say you should stick pretty close because you don't, you're going to run into some issues with mold forming. Um, so if it's a seed, um, I, I, I have read that, that, you know, if it, if it's a species that requires 60 days, that there can sometimes be success with um, taking it out after at least 30 days, but you're going to get better germination if you give it that 60. I would be really leery of leaving it in there very much longer. I, um, well, with, with this spring, I, I messed up my timing and put seeds in and, and I was on spring break for a week. And so they stayed in the refrigerator a little bit longer, um, not, you know, maybe a week or two longer. And for the most part, things were fine. I had a couple of things that grew some mold, but the seeds did okay. Um, but generally, I would stick to those those um, those time frames. You don't want either the the medium that you've got them in to dry out, or you don't want it to grow mold. Very often, you're going to find I had a few things sprout on me before they reached their thirty or sixty day mark. So um, just keep an eye on them. Okay, good, good, good to know. Um... Let's see, one just came in, Kentucky coffee bean tree is a really tough seed. Does it need a scarification? I have not tried to grow that one myself. I don't know a lot about it. I'd have to look it up, but I would imagine um, if it's a tough seed, like for example, like a um, uh, like an acorn too, like with that really hard outer covering, it might need a little scarification or some other kind of special treatment, but I'd have to look that up to know for sure. We do uh, have Tree I, Guy online, right, so you tree may guy. go ahead and answer that via the chat to keep you going. Okay. A couple of the other questions were related to a slide, but everyone has been answered as far as those three. Okay. If you're going to only have three plants in your yard, um, oh. those were. So we got that covered. So I'll turn you back to uh, your presentation. All right. So this last little category here are what I call other. <laughs> and there's quite a few others, but I just wanted to to highlight these three um, because some of them are, are fairly common, but others are just so wild that it was fascinating to me. So one of them, some seeds, and this might be something that would work with the Kentucky coffee tree, I'm not sure, but some seeds with really hard outer coats, you um, they um, recommend a, what they call a hot water treatment before you do your stratification. So basically you're putting your seeds in a container, you're boiling some water, and then you pour that boiling water over the seeds, let them sit over like 24 hours, and then you put the seeds in whatever stratification medium you're working with. It just helps to loosen up that seed coat even more. Um, purple poppy mallow is an example of one that, that they recommend that hot water stratification uh, or with stratification. The other one, I just find this incredibly fascinating, this whole process and on how plants work. Um, they're hemiparasitic. Basically, they need a host plant. And an example of that is Indian paintbrush. And so they're considered hemiparasitic because they, um, they, they have chlorophyll, they go through photosynthesis on their own, but their roots will intertwine with, or to get them germinating, you actually have to put the seed in another, like the base of another plant, kind of where the, where the, the main part of the above ground part of the plant meets the roots. 
And it's because the, the plant is not able to get some of the nutrients on its own. So it actually parasitizes other plants, um, not necessarily in a, in a detrimental way to the host plant, uh, because once like the Indian paintbrush gets going, it's got green leaves, it, it, it goes through photosynthesis, but it does need some of its nutrients to come through other plants. That is a whole other level of seed starting in my mind. Um, it's just fascinating. I have read that if you plant the Indian paintbrush seeds and some of these other hemiparasitic seeds at the same time and in the same container with their host, that as they both germinate um, or their roots will kind of mix together and they'll that'll still work. But um, the idea of having to make a little slit in, a, in an existing plant and popping another seed in, I'm always fascinated by how this even happened in the first place, <laughs> um, but it's pretty cool. Um, and then of course, uh, things in the legume family like purple prairie clover, clover the baptisia, the legumes that we already looked at, um, they sometimes benefit from a rhizobium inoculum, but even the, um, the, the uh, seed suppliers say it's not entirely necessary because a lot of these already exist in our soil. But if you want to give your plant a little extra boost, uh, maybe a little extra insur insurance plan, you can um, you know mix up that inoculum with the seed in the soil and it, it may help you get a better germination rate. You can buy those inoculums um, when you purchase your seeds if it's recommended uh, and they'll give you a species specific um, inoculums to help you. So purple prairie clover, white prairie clover are some examples um, that might need that as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about winter sowing. And um, I started this, I found, I, you know, like a lot of people, I just, you know, curious about gardening and I found videos on what, on the internet about this and gave it a try a couple of years ago and just I'm hooked. <laughs> I started with um, like plastic milk jugs like you see down there in the in the foreground. This is actually a picture of my yard from a few years ago. Uh, then I graduated up to trays and I just used whatever potting mix I normally would use, fill the trays, put the seeds out, label them all, I timed it really well this year. I did this in late December a couple of years ago and it was a beautiful, it was actually during the pandemic because I was I was making a video to show for a program because we were all in lockdown. I was out in my backyard. It was a, a breezy day, but it was in the fifties and, and got all these ready. And then the next day it snowed. So, which was perfect because then the snow covered the the, the trays with all the plants in them and kind of gave them a nice little insulator, kept the, the critters from digging around in the soil to get at them. Um, so essentially you can do like you see pictured there, um, or you can use these plastic milk jugs and you'll, or, or water jugs. You just don't wanna use the ones that are really, um, really white that don't let in any light. And essentially you kind of cut the jug almost all the way around, you know, maybe almost halfway up the jug and you're creating like a little container in there where you can flip the top part up um, and then poke some holes in the bottom of the jug, add your, um, add whatever potting mix you normally would use, um, put the seeds in there, label them, and you just set them out for the winter. And for a few years, I was doing this um, on January 1st. And <laughs> that was my New Year's Day fun is I would get all my winter sewing jugs ready and I would just put them outside. Um, I pre-moisten my soil mix uh, ahead of time, and then I just leave the lid off of the milk jug to let any snow or other moisture in, and you leave them out there all winter. And then as we get into those warmer days in March, I always go out and check them. If I see any green sprouting, then I take the tape off around that that middle part that's been kind of holding them together. And on warm days, I'll I'll flip the lid up so they don't cook in there. And essentially what you're able to do is start your plants. They're going through those natural conditions that they need to go through, but you're also hardening them off along the way. So you don't have to go through that hardening off process that you would do if you grew your plants inside and then tried to move them outside. Um, what I do then is, is I take the clumps of the little seedlings that are growing in the jugs and I'll move them um, into individual pots and grow them on in those individual pots. And usually 
by the fall in September, late September, I put them in the ground. They get a couple of weeks in the soil before we get um, get into winter again. And, and that's kind of how I, I work with mine. So you can use these jugs or you can do them in individual pots like you see on the right. One of um, uh, the folks that has come to some of my gardening programs shared with me what you see in the picture here is she put hardware cloth around it and, and tucked it in underneath the tray so that throughout the winter, um, squirrels or other little critters didn't go digging around in there and disturb the seeds um, before they could germinate. And then as the seeds germinate in the spring, she took those um, the hardware cloth off. And, you know, I've had varying levels of success. Some of the things that work really great for me were things like mist flower, uh, the bergamot, of course, baptisia works really well for me using this method. Um, purple coneflower, black-eyed Susans, uh, I'm trying to think, coreopsis I've tried with this. I even do some of my vegetable seeds. I did spinach once. It was fantastic. I loved it. Um, you can do tomatoes and peppers, but you would start those in um, in like March instead of January in our area. So really, really great way to uh, try out growing native seeds without having to mess around with that artificial stratification or scarification, because you're putting them out in the soil, they're being exposed to our natural freeze and thaw cycles. And um, and so it's, it's a good way to kind of get your feet wet and you can do a couple of jugs and see how you do, or a couple of trays and um, just play around with it. But it's one of my absolute go-tos. I've already been hoarding um, jugs all season long and they're in a big pile in my garage waiting for my my January 1st happy new year put my seeds out so um, when you are doing these methods I think I mentioned earlier but I just want to reiterate it again if you're going to direct sow out into your garden in the fall or do this um, this method here with winter sowing and containers um, you can start it generally speaking in our in where I'm at up in northern uh, Illinois we anytime after Thanksgiving up to January 1st just because we can get we're starting to get our springs are starting to get a little earlier up here and we want to make sure they get plenty of time in those cold moist conditions these are some resources that are um, that we're going to put in the chat for you the Lake County Forest Preserves with our big initiative to really um, encourage and support folks to remove non-native invasive species and add native plants. We've built out a whole section of our website on the topic with lots of really great resources and videos. So um, that's up here. Um, and then on that area too, um, I don't think I have it listed here, but in that section of the website is a link to our seed guide, which I'm gonna pop up in a second here to show you. Prairie Moon Nursery is again, my go-to resource to find out all kinds of stuff about native plants. I was like, oh, I have an area of my garden that gets direct sun and I want to put something in there that doesn't get any taller than two feet. I go to Prairie Moon and I start, you know, plugging away and, 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 and searching and they have range maps that show you, does it plant naturally grow in your county um, or, or whatever. So it's a really great resource. And then um, this other link is, is a really great resource on, on really getting um, down into the nitty gritty of winter sowing and some really good tips if you wanna do that. And I'll just do a, a little plug for the Lake County Forest Preserves. We have a, a, a email address that we developed uh, during the pandemic called ask an educator at lcfpd.org. So if you have questions, you can send it to that email address. It goes to all of our educators, you usually get an answer within 24 hours because somebody's always at the office. Um, and we have a lot of really great programs. If you're ever in the Lake County area, we do things in person, uh, but we do some things on uh, virtually as well. We host a native gardeners club called Native Gardeners Club, Ready, Set, Grow. It is uh, free for our Lake County, Illinois residents. We meet the fourth Thursday of every month at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. And then um, we do some in-person things throughout the year as well. Um, however, this, this upcoming one in September, I will tell you, it's pretty much what I just did for you guys tonight. That's our topic is starting native plants from seed. But um, if you're interested, do check us out on our website. And at this point, I am going to turn my camera back on. 
And I'm going to stop sharing this video because I want to share um, the seed guide a little bit if I can. Just to give you a heads up, we are at the top of the hour. Oh, no. Okay, then I'm going to just jump <laughs> right into questions. Sorry, I tend to talk on a little bit too much here. Right, well, thank you. Well, thanks so much, Eileen. Uh, very helpful. Seeing the picture of the, um, the ready, what did you say, ready, set, grow, go, or whatever. Right. First time I collected wild geranium, I collected the little buckets at the end. And I brought them back to my office and I'm like, I don't see any seeds in these. <laughs> so anyway, uh, well, uh, Deb, uh, are there a few questions here at the end, maybe? Uh, there were a few more. Let me bring it back up. I was uh, wanting to make sure I got all the links posted real quick for those who may uh, need to start leaving. Let's see here. All right. So yeah. generally speaking, when we think about the milk jugs with most of our native seeds that uh, just need stratification, regardless of the duration, um, it's kind of like a hands-off approach, right? So they just wanted to get that clarification and understanding that that's kind of what that whole process is. Yeah, you just put those seeds out in the jugs and let them go. And um, it would be like they were out there on their own anyway, but you've got them in a contained area. So you know that the thing that is sprouting is what you planted in there. So make sure you label those jugs. Ah, good, good. Uh, and speaking of the jugs, I saw that they were all nicely labeled. Um, I tried that for the first time this winter in, in most of my labels, even though I put like a, a piece of tape over the top, they've all faded. Mm. Um, so I don't know if there was a special marker or maybe also marking inside the jugs is a good thing. Yeah, I've had that happen where I write directly on the jug with Sharpie marker, and I also do a, one of those little white labels and pop it right into the jug, and that way I have an extra little security. Ah, good. What, one of the markers that I've uh, used quite a bit, other than just pencil on, on the plastic labels, is the garden marker by mm. Airline, and it does, unlike Sharpies, it, it doesn't go away, and it, it'll last several years. That's a good tip. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, so someone asked, uh, can one use a raised bed and covered with a screen for the winter sowing? And I and I think that was um, a raised bed. So I guess there would be a little bit of air kind of going underneath it. Um, so ra any kind of raised bed should be fine. Again, the the if you've got one that's on legs, they're generally pretty deep. So that's enough soil mass to kind of insulate the seeds like they would be if they were kind of in our normal conditions. Or if you've got a raised bed that's on the ground in your garden, that like my vegetable garden is all raised beds because I my sunny spot is in the front yard and I need to make it neat and tidy. Um, but you could definitely do that. You could put the seeds in a, in a raised bed and put some hardware cloth over the top to kind of protect them and just let the snow fall on them or whatever winter conditions you'll experience in your area. Uh, but yeah, you could totally do that. And then you just, um, for some of these species, the earlier that you can, you know, kind of dig them out and move them to um, a bigger or a different pot to kind of, if you're going to grow them on that way, a lot of things will grow a pretty substantial root very quickly, like milkweeds and um, baptisia. So the sooner you get them into whatever container you want to keep them in for the summer, the better. Okay, good. Um, another question came through for winter sowing. What type of uh, potting soil or mix should be used? Uh, they presume it's not garden soil, um, or is it something like potting mix for containers? Um, you could use a potting mix for containers, um, anything that you're going to, I would use, I generally use whatever I use to start like my, my vegetable seeds in the spring. And I'm really experimenting now because I'm trying to move away from peat based products. Um, and that's been a little tricky. I found a, a peat free potting mix this spring. I can't even remember the brand, but it was not very good. And then I um, heard of this product called pit moss and it's, it's a material that's used by processing and shredding up like recycled paper. And I mixed that with a, a compost and like 50-50 and everything did great. So that's what I'm going to try this winter is this pit moss, P-I-T-M-O-S-S. -S. Let me put that in the chat and compost. Okay. All right. Um, 
So a lot of seed collecting is starting now through, you know, October. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to keep the seeds, I guess, dry and um, viable before you actually put them out in December, January, or in the refrigerator at the right amount of time? Sure. Um, that's a really good point. And I forgot to mention that earlier. Generally, any species that is going to be setting seed um, in in April, May, early June, you got to sow that right away. They're not meant to be stored. Anything that's going to be setting their seed and the seed will ripen in July and later, you can collect it. Um, it just making sure that that they're, they're, I use like the little brown lunch bags all the time, or if I'm collecting a lot of something, I'll use the big brown paper grocery bags because it's going to allow the the seeds to kind of um, breathe a little bit, but also dry out. And I leave them just like in my, my, I have a tri-level down in my, my lower level. It stays kind of cool and dry in the summer. And then if I'm going to, if I don't get them stratified I, and I'm going to store them longer, I sometimes put them in smaller little paper envelopes and keep them in the refrigerator. Um, you can freeze some things, but generally speaking, the refrigerator is fine. So if you're not going to deal with them this year, I'd put them in your refrigerator. If you happen to have a second refrigerator where you can store a bunch of brown paper bags, but um, I avoid storing my seeds in plastic just because I don't want them to accumulate any kind of moisture and rot. Right, right. I know we've gone over um, and you didn't get a chance to talk about uh, your seed guide I have posted the link, but if you Perfect. can just spend a minute or two to let those that are still online know what it is um, so they can, you know, look forward to clicking on that link later. Yeah, um, I don't, oh, I was going to, I don't have it readily available, so I'm not going to share it, but it's a, it's a guide that was put together by um, uh, one of my coworkers, Kelly Schultz. She is a restoration ecologist for the Lake County Forest Preserves, but she used to run our native seed nursery a wealth of knowledge, just phenomenal. Um, so in that link that we sent, it gives you um, access to, I believe it covers 60 species of native plants. She goes into some more detail about the different categories that I explained at the beginning, uh, but it's got phenomenal pictures that are um, that show the size of the seeds up against like a, a ruler. So um, it talks a little bit about when to collect and how to collect. There's also should be access to a video there of Kelly explaining the seed guide itself. So it's a really great resource and um, and it's really helpful. You can you can download it and print it and just kind of keep it with you. And uh, it really is is phenomenal. The pictures are beautiful. The volunteer Dale that did the photography, he's phenomenal. And they got a lot of really great pictures of the plant. Um, the seed capsule and then what the seeds look like. So you can see them in different stages and know what you're looking at. Great. Sounds great. I look forward to looking at it myself. Yeah. All right. I think that's the, um, all the questions we had. And so I will um, turn it back over to Bill to wrap up. Okay. Thanks, Deb. And uh, Eileen, thanks so much. Uh, very, very helpful. Uh, as far as the uh, Lake County Seed Collection Guide, uh, as I mentioned when we uh, talked before the uh, it before the presentation started, I use that nearly daily. And we do have the whole guide. Uh, we have a link to that that Kelly has shared in the past on our website, indiananativeplants.org, and it's in the area of growing native plants from seed. And then we've got a lot of resources, similar probably to what uh, 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 Eileen had talked about earlier. But well, well, we better go ahead and wind up now. Uh, but if you have any additional questions on the presentation or native seed communities, uh, feel free to reach out via the links that Deb shared in the chat. Also, we invite you to join our Facebook group. Uh, pictures and videos are welcome on how your propagation is going. And has it been our pattern? Uh, we have another presentation in September on Monday, the 25th at 5 p.m. We will be hearing from Ray Major from Trees from Seed. For those of you that are familiar with his, his uh, Trees from Seed uh, page, uh, he will be uh, presenting Oaktober instead of October, Oaktober. And we'll be discussing everything you need to know about 
growing uh, growing oaks from seed, and we hope to see a bunch of you bunch of you there. Uh, so anyway, thanks, Eileen, for your informative session. Also, thank you, Deb Hausen, for all your help tonight and all the help that you've given with this project uh, over the past year. Uh, it was good to see you all. We'll sign off for now. Happy growing natives from seed. Bye-bye, all. Thank you. Bye.